is one of my all-time favorite people, whom I have known now for over 15 years. And I think, as she just mentioned, we, we saw each other as kindred spirits who are willing to say inappropriate things at inappropriate times. <laughs> and I appreciate that in another person. Um, she is a graduate of UC Santa Cruz, so go banana slugs. Or do you say slither banana slugs? I don't know. What do you say exactly? You said go slugs. Go slugs, yeah. okay. And she got her PhD from Rutgers. She's currently an associate professor in the Department of Social and Cultural Analysis at NYU, and she also directs Latino studies there, and is lucky to say that she's going to be at the Institute for Advanced Study next year at Princeton, and I'm very, I'm very jealous of the fact that she's going to be there. Um, her book, The Trouble with Unity, is a fabulous volume published by Oxford University Press, which won the Ralph Bunch Award from the American Political Science Association, which is the highest award you can win on race and politics in, in APSA, and they also won an award from the section, organized section on race, ethnicity, and politics as well. She is currently working on a new project on Latino conservatives, um, in, tentatively entitled Latino Conservatives, Racial Shame, Racial Success, and the Politics of Transformation, where she's really going to delve into the logics um, of a conservative thought within the Latino community, which is something not, not very many scholars have done, and given her previous work, I'm sure she'll be so brilliant. And today, she's going to be talking about dreamers and their uh, relationship to redefining democratic citizenship. So with that, I present Professor Lisa. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, uh, I want to thank uh, Professor Garcia Bedoya and the Center for Latino Policy and Research, um, especially Veronica Velez as well, for um, inviting me here. It's great to be back in the Bay Area, um, especially, I'm so cold all the time in New York. I'm cold for like months and months, like a Chicana in New York. I'm just cold all the time. And um, so it's great to be back here for so many reasons. That is not unimportant. Um, even when you're cold here, you're not cold. It's not 10 degrees. You're fine. <laughs> you have no idea how bad it is. Um, so this, uh, this talk is entitled, Undocumented, Unafraid, and Unapologetic. Dream Activism and the Queering of Democratic Citizenship. And when I initially started this project, or started doing this, this essay, um, just coming out in a volume with MIT Press, hopefully, on um, youth, new, uh, new social media and citizenship, it was before the election when we discovered that comprehensive immigration reform was going to come back on the table. We were hoping it would. But as we know, for a long time, immigration had kind of been dead in the water politically until the 2012 presidential election, when suddenly we realized that it was important that Latino and Asian American voters were coming out in large numbers, and that perhaps talking about self-deportation was going to cause Republicans to lose national elections, and they began talking again about the politics of immigration, and now it's back as a serious policy discussion. Um, so on the one hand, this project is about something that's not new, US politicians debating immigration. Um, but what I think is new, and what I want to talk to you about today, is the role that the undocumented themselves are playing in this debate. Rather than a population being talked about, this time around, the debate has been powerfully shaped by the, by the organizing and actions of the undocumented who have been speaking out and organizing and working to influence policy across the country. Um, and so more specifically, what this talk, and this, this, uh, the essay this talk is based on, looks at dream activism, particularly the work of queer dream activists, and how they use forms of new social media um, as a space of confrontation, creativity, and self-assertion. Now, as we know, and this audience knows this, but as we know, dreamers aren't the first group of undocumented political actors, right? Unauthorized immigrants have long engaged in widespread protests throughout the 20th century, fights for worker rights, fights against anti-immigration, um, have led to uh, forms of undocumented resistance and activism. I mean, um, in California especially, we can think of almost 20 years ago in 1994, um, which I can't believe was 20 years ago, um, the passage of California's Proposition 187. So in one sense, um, immigrant, particularly undocumented political activism is, is not new. But what is new is how new social media creates additional opportunities to engage the task of claiming space and rights. So this paper offers an analysis of dream activism through their use of social media. And I want to think about how they're using what I'm calling a form of agonistic publicity to create what I'm talking about as cyber epistemonial, right? Where they're putting themselves forward and challenging their conditions of precarity by sharing their personal stories and their political analysis. So, so this paper looks at the organizing efforts of these young undocumented youth 
who just this summer achieved a major, again, you guys all know this, but who achieved a major victory by getting Obama on June 15th to pass deferred deportation, right? And the passage of, a passage of DACA, while not a path to citizenship, deferred action certainly set the terms and some of the conditions and gave undocumented youth a sense of their own political efficacy um, after a long period of organizing um, and um, being able to sort of change um, their status in ways that change their lives. Um, and I should know real quickly that I'm drawn to this topic. I've done some work because I had a long-standing interest. I don't think of myself as an immigration specialist. Um, there are many people here who do immigration scholarship and the law in really rich and important ways. I do not. Um, I'm a democratic theorist. I do political theory. And so my interest has always been in the political activism of the undocumented, right, which I've written about previously. And I've written about the marches in 2006, for example, as, as an example of this sort of moment of the undocumented claiming space um, making demands, um, becoming <clears throat> civically legible. So I have this ongoing interest in how the undocumented and the unauthorized make demands, and more importantly, enact a citizenship they don't have. And I think it's really interesting to think about how a group that doesn't have citizenship is in some ways living out citizenship in richer and more serious ways than many people who have legal status. Right, so that this question then of what is citizenship, right? Is it a status? Is it something you, you have? Or is citizenship something you do? Right? And, and in the case of the undocumented, <coughs> citizenship is something they do. Right? So this performative act has always been interesting to me. And one of the most exciting things that's happened since I wrote on the marches of 20, 2006 has been the immigrant activism that's come from Dreamers, particularly in the last two or three years when they've appropriated the strategies of visibility developed during the gay rights movement, or that some of the strategies that they're using were developed during the gay rights movement. So for example, in 2010 and 2011, Dreamers organized a political campaign called Coming Out of the Shadows, which included a series of speeches where they came out and openly declared their undocumented status. And I think now we think of this as sort of the norm, but you, can't, you have to kind of try to remember how mind-blowing that and how risk-taking that act is and was, right? Um, and organized, they organized that right in the effort to build support for the Dream Act. And that campaign was explicitly modeled on the National Coming Out Day initiated in 1988 to promote LGBT rights. And during the rallies, Dreamers declared themselves undocumented and unafraid, with the slogan expanding in 2011 to undocumented, unafraid, and unapologetic. So since then, more and more unauthorized youth have decided to reject secrecy in favor of claiming membership through an aggressive politics of visibility and protest that now includes cross-state pilgrimages, hunger strikes, bus tours, rallies, sit-ins, and other forms of direct action, many of which I'm sure people in this room have been a part of. Um, often LGBT youth themselves, many activists emphasize the linkages that exist between coming out as queer and coming out as undocumented. In other words, the politics of coming out and the refusal of secrecy that characterizes queer activism has become a cultural touchstone for the growing immigrant rights movement. Moreover, in thinking about the multiple and overlapping ways um, that um, of both passing and coming out, the activism of queer dreamers has worked to expose the linkages between sexuality and migration. And this was an unforeseen and unanticipated shift in the politics of immigrant rights. As Ivy Lupai argues, the presence of these subjects challenges our longstanding tendency to quote, as she puts it, to presume that either all queers are legal citizens or that all immigrants are heterosexual, unquote. So it's my contention that dreamers are harnessing the democratic possibilities of new social media in ways that highlight their role as agents of change rather than the usual attempts to treat them as a criminalized population. Moreover, the proliferation of dreamers' heterogeneous views regarding the politics of immigration and inclusion matter here, right? So that's one thing I'm really interested in is they're not saying one thing. They're saying a lot of things, um, things that don't always even agree with each other, right? And there's this sort of proliferation of voices out there. And so you see some, and I'll show some videos today, right? Well, some express familiar claims, you know, very familiar claims regarding nationalism, integration, liberal recognition. There are also voices of more radical activists who are resisting the disciplinary logic that demands immigrants express themselves only as grateful and dutiful subjects. Instead, many dreamers are putting forward critiques of US policy regarding immigration and globalization, and those critiques are irreverent, audacious, and yes, unapologetic emphasizing peer-to-peer -peer forms of communication that mix newer technologies with older forms of mobilization. The use of new social media facilitates what I want to characterize as Dreamer's queer vision of democracy. 
a participatory politics that rejects secrecy in favor of nonconformist visibility, choice, and protest. Now, I think they're offering, um, now for those of you who, um, you know, don't know, I mean, I don't want to talk too much about what the DREAM Act is, and it's still kind of, it always changes every time we try to put it back on the legislative table. But as we know, the DREAM Act is an acronym for the Development, Relief, and Education for Alien Minors Act. Introduced in 2001, 2001. Um, the DREAM Act right, would extend a six-year conditional legal status to the undocumented youth who meet several criteria, including entry in the U.S. before the age of 16, receipt of a high school diploma or GED, qualifying youth to be authorized to work in the U.S., go to college, or join the military. And if during a six-year period they graduate from a two-year college or complete two years of a four-year degree or serve at least two years of military service, the beneficiary would be able to adjust from conditional to permanent residence status, thus putting them on a pathway to, to legalized status. And we know that this keeps changing with, depending on which DREAM Act is going through. Um, but I think that the fact that this DREAMer militancy is offering what I'm thinking of as sort of an intersectional critique of immigration, one thing I think it exposes is how the cry out of the closet and into the streets is able to resonate with multiple populations. Right? So let me say a little bit about new social media. Um, Right, and when I say new social media, I'm thinking of things like YouTube, Twitter, Tumblr, Facebook, right, all that stuff. All the stuff that I'm kind of crap at using, mostly. Um, I do email, and I have a dumb phone. I don't have a smartphone. Um, so I have a stupid phone that barely lets me text. But for people who are using all these forms of new social media, um, the rise of open source sites and the increasing ease of generating original content has allowed dream activists to create an alternative public sphere, right? Um, and to do this in the paper, I draw on the research of the MacArthur Research Network on Youth and Participatory Politics, which I'll refer now from now on as the YPP. Right? This report was done by Kathy Cohen and Joe Kahn from Mills College, and they were sort of the, the head researchers. And the project looked at you, you know, youth and media and new social media, and they were not focused on undocumented youth per se, but their analysis, I think, helps us think a little bit about how new social media operates. So let me tell you a couple quick things about what the YPP report says. Um, one thing the YPP report notes is that in the past, attempts at outreach through networks were often bound by physical constraint, right? We often, when you wanted to reach out to people, you reached out to your immediate friends, families, and in localities, right? Today, through email and platforms such as YouTube, Facebook, Tumblr, LinkedIn, Twitter, <coughs> participants now are at least able to engage and sometimes send information to a much larger group of people, right? And this is something that's sort of new. And I think there's an ongoing debate about what's new about new social media, and we can talk about that. Like, what's really new versus mail versus phone? You know, what makes this new? Um, now, while the circulation and distribution of information is important, an equally important aspect of the internet has been its ability to lessen the constraints of place for marginalized communities and populations. And in that sense, both queer and undocumented youth are populations that must at times contend with conditions of isolation often being under assault in the localities they live in. So for such communities, the creation of online spaces, spaces where they can speak to similar, similarly situated individuals, share their stories, and organize themselves has been a significant development. And for subjects whose status literally leave them unable to move around freely across the country, the internet has been transformative. Right? Lacking proper documentation, social media such as Skype, Facebook, and YouTube expand the space of appearance for undocumented youth, allowing them to participate in multiple publics in ways they were previously unable. And this is an important transformation since even 2006, when Facebook hadn't really begun. Right? So you can see how quickly this has been shifting. Um, now one thing that's interesting is when we talk about new social media, um, given this is a predominantly minority community of low-income youth, precisely the population that experts often worry are victims of a digital divide. Right? But according to the YPP report, one of its more interesting findings is that online access is becoming less of an issue for all youth in the United States. And as they put it in the report, quote, with the advances in technology and the resulting proliferation of both computers and mobile devices able to access the internet, it is now rare that a young person does not own some device that can access the internet, unquote. And then again, another quote, our data indicate that nearly all young people have access to a computer that connects to the internet. Strikingly, nearly 95% of all youth across racial and ethnic groups report having access to a computer that connects to the internet, right? And one thing they talk about is that this is actually a form of digital social capital, right? And um, 
Um, one of the, and I think that's really interesting too, is that this is a form of social capital that like other forms in the past, like bowling, things that Paul Putnam has talked about, um, um, you know, the fact that people don't get access to internet devices because they want to be good civic subjects. They get on because they want to send each other like cute cat videos and, um, you know, check out what their friends are wearing and post pictures of themselves drunk on Facebook. Like people, that's what people use the internet for. But they also use it to generate content. They also use it to send a petition. They also use it to um, tell a story about their own experience being undocumented. So the fact that people, that youth are utilizing these resources, not necessarily in, with civic intentions, but that it can be transformed right into, into digital social capital is, is one of the more interesting elements of, <coughs> of, of this tool, right? Um, now the YPP report also notes that one of the other significant aspects of new social media is it facilitates forms of participation, quote, not guided by deference to elites or formal institutions. Instead, participation is often peer-based, focused on expression, interactive, non-hierarchical, and not guided by deference to elite-driven institutions, unquote. Right, so posting a video, joining an online group, forwarding somebody else's article or opinion piece, calling for a mass action or meeting, all of these are actions that can be done independent of elites or formal political institutions. So in this way, interactive social media practices are more easily able to circumvent traditional gatekeepers of information, such as newspaper editors, political parties, and interest groups, and advocacy organizations. Right? So being able to both engage and sidestep mainstream immigrant advocates and elites was crucial to Dream Activist's ability to what I'm calling, you know, to pluralize the politics of immigration moving beyond the liberal politics of representation that have defined previous debates, right? They didn't ask permission. They just began acting the way they wanted to act and putting forward policy preferences that they had. So unlike in previous years then, dreamers were able to gain access to the public realm outside traditional sites of information and influence, such as newspapers, television, parties, et cetera, right? Yet, as principal researchers Kathy Cohen and Joseph Kahn note, this is not simply a participatory politics that's online. In the case of Dreamers, online sites produced new forms of digital social capital that fed into various grassroots actions and activities on the ground. In other words, Dream activism confirms a point that, that's made in the YPP report that says, quote, youth who engage in participatory politics are much likely to also engage in institutional activities, such as voting, than those who do not engage in participatory acts, unquote. So in this way, Dreamers' participatory online culture exposes how they themselves understand and exploit the connection between radical activism and the politics of voting and legislation. And I think we've gotten so used to talking about the Dreamers that we sort of forget this fact, that what they're fighting for is this very liberal piece of legislation, right? We know the Dream Act is, you know, it does some really problematic dividing, right, between like bad parents and good children who didn't do anything wrong, and they're innocent. They're not like they're illegal parents, they're the good guys. Um, and yet, Dreamers are using all this radical politics to challenge that divide to refuse to you know, push aside their parents and are using radical forms of new social media that aren't always just geared to legislation. Right? So it's precisely that kind of mix between radical action and legislation that, that makes this such an interesting political moment. Right? And it sort of shows us how the line between participatory and institutional politics isn't cut and dry, and how new social media kind of creates these continuums of social engagement. Now as Diane Fuss has written, the process of coming out can be understood as, as she puts it, a movement into a metaphysics of presence, speech, and cultural visibility. In this way, as Fuss puts it, to be out is, quote, really to be in, inside the realm of the visible, the speakable, and the culturally intelligible, unquote. For undocumented youth, coming out represented a similar effort to become civically legible and politically speakable. Not surprisingly, the practice of coming out has become a staple of immigrant youth politics. Um, equally significant has been the posting online of multiple stories where people openly name themselves as undocumented. And the increasing multiplicity of testimonials on various websites and blogs means that the voices of the undocumented are prolifer proliferating in ways that can't simply be easily screened or controlled. Right? And one question I always have is like the, the risks of that, right? What's exciting and also the dangers of that possibility. Um, so let me say a little bit more about what I mean when I say they're queering the movement. Um, and thinking about how what it might mean to queer the politics of immigration. I'm thinking here of Michael Warner and his claim that we define queer as, as he puts it, quote, a rejection of a minoritizing logic of toleration or simple political interest representation in favor of a more thorough resistance to regimes of the normal. As Lupite argues, 
This definition of queer is valuable in its call, as she puts it, quote, to transform rather than seek accommodation within existing social structures, unquote. So in contesting the logic of accommodation, queer undocumented youth often frame their activism <coughs> in terms of the intersection between a politics of migration and a politics of sexuality. And since I'm talking all about this new social media, I thought I should show you some, um, so it wouldn't just be me talking about it. Um, so let me, let's start with the first one on um, the um, queer. Uh, this is a piece that was put forward by a group. I have a few of them, but they're all short, I promise. Um, maybe I shouldn't promise, because they're always more interesting than anything I'm going to say. Um, no, not this one. Oh, not this one? No, it's the very first one that I sent you last. Oh, the last one? Yeah. Oh, is that? Yeah, queer and documented. Okay. And then it'll go from there. Sure. Veronica is saving my life. I have to do this one. Just say it alone. Allow everything. Make everything. Yeah. <laughs> it's only For the first time, nationally, queer documented youth and allies are coming together to share stories, empower each other, and put our words into action. My name is Tony Ortonia. My name is Kirsten Cortez. Hi, my name is My name is Aldo Cruz. My name is Claudia Ramirez, and we're queer and undocumented. So being queer and undocumented means um, accepting and understanding my realities and my identities and learning from them every single day. To be undocumented and queer is like a depressing challenge, where I know who I am, but I feel like coming up twice in different spaces. Being queer and undocumented means that I can use both stories to empower myself and empower a lot of my community. Being queer and undocumented sometimes means having to be in an awkward position in which you feel people have to ask, which one do you care more about? Being undocumented and queer is fighting an already uphill battle by being a double minority. So that's just a quick piece. Um, now, and you can, if you go online, you find a bunch of different pieces on this. That was just a quick one, so I thought I'd show it because it was fast. Um, and it does some work. Um, but queer dreamers, in many critical ways, beyond even what they said here, forced the immigrant rights movement to consider how sexuality has served as the grounds for controlling what sorts of newcomers are allowed to enter the country. As scholars of migration and sexuality have noted, because the US government does not recognize lesbian and gay relationships as a legitimate basis for acquiring legal permanent residence status, lesbian gay couples are denied access to one of the most common ways to become a legal permanent resident through direct <laughs> ties. By denaturalizing the limited and heteronormative logic of family-defining immigration policy, queer critiques of immigration expose how the US immigration control apparatus, quote, significantly regulates sexuality and, re and reproduces oppressive sexual norms that are gendered, racialized, and classed. Now, another aspect of this is that Dreamer's use of new social media and their appearance on the public stage is not without risk. Using social media to publicly name themselves as undocumented makes activists vulnerable to new forms of surveillance and state power. Declaring their st status heightens their risk of visibility, increasing the risk of detention or deportation for themselves and their families. Yet given the ongoing violence of mass deportation and political attacks against the undocumented and their families, Dreamers persuasively have argued that the liberal language of privacy offers no haven for non-citizens. I think it's a really important. I think it's a really important point, right? That um, the liberal language of privacy offers little haven for non-citizens, right? That given what's happened in Arizona, given what's happened in Alabama, right? For these subjects, resisting publicity and embracing secrecy guarantees neither security nor freedom from interference. So to be silent and faceless only enables conditions of exploitation and violence. So I want to show you a few examples of the political range of dream activism. So, um, one of the things in the past few years is there's been this proliferation of people going online and the videos often have a certain kind of script and we'll see a couple of them here and you've probably seen some of them, you might even posted some of these, um, where they sort of name their status, um, they give their full name, they name one's taboo status, right, coming out as a documented queer or both, and sometimes they state, if you're watching this, it's because I've been arrested. And then they go on to tell um, their speaker status, why they feel it's important to come out, and urging others to join the movement. So I wanted to show you a couple, um, one by Georgina Perez and another by um, Ver uh, Veridiana Martinez. And one of the reasons I wanted to show you these together, they don't mention their sexual orientation. But I want to suggest that they're queering the movement in the ways that Warner's talking about. 
right? They're, because of their, the way they're framing immigration as a politics, I'm suggesting this is a queer, a queering of immigration politics, whether or not they talk about their own sexual orientation, which, which they don't. So let's start with Georgina. And this was a little bit longer than three minutes. She posted this on April of 2011. And she disappeared. <laughs> Is there anything on the smaller one there? Can you do that all the way up? Can you do that all the way up? It's as far as it Yeah, goes. that's the one that. That's oh, I wish I'd known that. Um, yeah. that do you better the other then. Then do better. Yeah, then I might read this one around. Okay. Oh, can you put that mic on there? Would that help? Which is, which mic? Oh, speakers. Oops. Do the other one and look. I might read this one to you then. I know. <laughs> Just when you think it's going to be the savior of everything, it screws everything up. This is telling a different story about technology. My name is Viviana Martinez. I am undocumented. If you're watching this video, I've been arrested. I grew up in the small town of Stafford, North Carolina. I'm a proud North Carolinian. I'm a taxpayer, but most importantly, I am a human being whose dreams have been denied. Why did I take part in an act of civil disobedience? Putting my freedom on the line. Why would I willingly face deportation, risking my future and my own home? Because I've had enough. My people are being criminalized for crossing borders to seek a better life, while the industries that drove us here are not being held accountable. My community is under attack by legislation that strips people of their humanity. Our human right to an education is under attack and has been for years. Because our own Senator Kay Hagan has denied the dreams of 51,000 North Carolinian youth. Remaining in the shadows is no longer acceptable. Protesting, rallying, and lobbying is no longer enough. If you're watching this and have not spoken out, it's time you come out and declare yourself undocumented and unafraid. If you tirelessly pushed for the Dream Act last year and feel like giving up, don't. It's time to escalate. So which side are you on? There is no neutral ground. Will you speak out with me or silently join our oppressors? Um, I won't, um, and Georgiana's is a very similar one where she talks about her mother, and that one, there's a little bit there where she's just talking about her mother and the fact that she's proud of her mother, her mother's courageous, her mother's a hero, she's not gonna you know, push her away, um, she's, she's grateful she brought her here. Um, so I wanna say a couple quick things about, about this one and, um, and the one I didn't get to show you, but, but one of the things that's interesting in both these videos, and you saw it in, um, um, in the Martinez video, is they both make these complex and audacious claims to membership and rights. Right, so Martinez claims herself, if you, if you heard her right, she claims herself as a taxpayer, and she names herself a proud North Carolinian. Benes, in her statement, states that she is a proud Georgian as well as a proud Mexicana. Right, in a similar vein, Martinez describes Kay Hagan as our own senator, while Benes claimed that elected officials have given them the runaround. Both of these dreamers claim themselves as Southerners who have the authority to criticize and make demands on elected officials. In this way, their affective ties to the South also represent acts of resistance. Both women are asserting their rights as deserving members of a polity that refuses to claim them. In their refusal to apologize for their actions, both fight any characterizations of the undocumented as unlawful subjects who've committed an offense. In fact, and then instead, they name immigration policies, the US political process, and the misdeeds of politicians as the sites of wrongdoing and offense. Even more significantly, Perez and Martinez both refuse to accept the criminalizing logic of unauthorized border crossings. For Perez, this refusal is tied to her identity as a daughter and in relationship to her mother. For Perez, this refusal, um, so rather than blaming her mother, I'm sorry, for Perez, rather than blaming her mother for her own status as undocumented, she tearfully, in the video, she sort of wells up, and she expresses her love and respect and gratitude for her mother's choices, saying, I'm not going to blame her for bringing me here, calling her a very, very courageous woman and my hero. In a more structural vein, 
Martinez situates unauthorized migration within a critique of the neoliberal policies of globalization. Mm -hmm. right? As she states, my people are being criminalized for crossing borders to seek a better life while the industries that drove us here are not being held accountable. Mm -hmm. unquote. Refusing to ignore the economic <clears throat> factors that integrate economies but segregate populations, Martinez boldly rejects the logic of guilt and criminalization, offering instead a call to mass protest that is both angry and determined. Right? Which side are you on? There is no neutral ground. That is in Martinez's speeches regarding the structural and the affective dynamics of immigration then explode the simplistic logic of legal, illegal, and puts a human face on the complex dynamics of migration as the space of economic arrangements, human desire, and community building. So we see that as in Martinez working to destigmatize the status of the undocumented while also demanding their unique life stories be heard and seen. Refusing to abide by nationalist scripts that demand immigrants express only love and gratitude towards the United States, both young women express anger and frustration at US policy, calling for an intensification of mass action. Right, so in Perez, she says, in order to beat this, we have to show them we're more unafraid than ever before. Right? Martinez says, it's time to escalate. Refusing allies' advice to be quiet, Perez refuses to, as she puts it, and you didn't see this, but Perez at one point says, she's not going to, quote, wait for someone to come dictate and tell me what to do, stating that I will no longer stand and wait for someone to come and save me, unquote. Calling on her fellow dreamers and allies to join, she argues, quote, in order for us to beat this, we have to show them we're more unafraid than ever before, unquote. So as I noted earlier, um, new social media allows for this proliferation of expressive practices and critiques produced by a diverse group of undocumented youth. But given this, the internet shows us not only agonistic critiques of women like Bedez and Martinez, but also more liberal depictions of dream activism. And so I want to consider the website We Are America, Stories of Today's Immigrants, which presents posts drawing on more liberal narratives of service and membership. Um, and I want to show a little bit of the story of Carlos Roa here. Um, and this is from We Are America. So this is a, sort of another, another way of articulating dreamer desire. And you can hold the whole, you can actually play the whole thing. You can do the one. I'm America. I am 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 America. We are America. <coughs> my name is Carl Shaw, and I am America. My family and myself came to the United States back in 1989. I was only two years old. My grandfather came to this country in 1948, U.S. citizen since 1958, and he, he had the opportunity to realize his American dream. My dad tried year after year to get, get us legalized and spent tens of thousands of dollars with lawyers, and still nothing. It's been 20 years. People think it's as easy as getting behind the line. It's not like that. I feel bad about it because it's like, how is it possible like, you know, that people like my father are still undocumented? You know, having a father that was a U.S. citizen for over 40 years, I graduated in 2005 from high school and I, and I wanted to get into college. I wanted to join the military and, and those options like weren't, I, I couldn't take, do any of that. And so it's frustrating, you know, the fact that I, I want to get back, you know, I'm willing to serve this country uh, in military uh, service and it's, I, I'm, I don't even have the option to do so. When you're shooting down people's dreams, it's, that's bad. And it's bad for everyone, not just immigrants. And then he just, it's a story about his mother was diagnosed with breast cancer. <coughs> I feel bad. I'm like, I know that's really sad, but we took this part. This part you're about the if you work hard and if you try and, and, and you, know, you strive and you can realize your potential and you, you can um, be a contributing member to society, uh, that's it's something that this country has prided itself on. And you know, we've seen that. Turn, at the turn of the century, you know, we saw how uh, immigrants, um, you know, changed this nation, you know, for the better, you know, of Irish, of Polish, of Italian descent, how uh, they were, were able to shape, or most very, very much change this nation for the better, and make this country better. You know, we are no different than the immigrants of the past. Now I should know, right? So there's cheesy music. It's the bad, bad music, bad music. Um, now Roe is a dream activist, right? He is one of four students who in 2010 walked 1,500 miles to Washington, D.C. 
as part of the trail of dreams. Yet, alongside his activism, Roa's testimonial hews to a certain kind of what Bonnie Honig has described as a kind of xenophilic narrative of, um, of the good and giving foreigner. Right? Unlike Perez and Martinez, who criticize American policies and name themselves undocumented and unafraid, you'll notice Roa never says, I'm undocumented. He says, I am American. Right? He talks about his dad being undocumented. Um, and he chooses not to clarify his status. Right? Instead, he states, right, I'm America. He characterizes himself as a patriotic subject willing to serve in the military during wartime. While risking de you know, deportation in order to come out as undocumented, Roa's activisability is also pre uh, sort of premised on his ability or his willingness to serve as an exceptional patriot, right? a tolerable ethnic, <coughs> willing to serve and to protect Americans from various intolerable ethnics, such as terrorists, etc. In a similar vein, in speaking of the United States as a land of hard work and opportunity, Roa locates his own family story in the larger story of European immigration to America, right? saying, we're no different than the immigrants of the past. Now, while such efforts are understandable, they might resonate, we should think about who, who's watching these and who's, you know, who's it resonating with. Right? <coughs> They're appealing to different kinds of audiences, right? But we ought to think about how does this video also work to sustain the binary of good immigrant versus bad immigrant, mm -hmm. right? Those, are who are, those who are worthy of being folded back into life and those whose lives are understood to be of less value. Um, I want to give you, I only have two more quick videos. Um, there's also what, one of the interesting things about the proliferation of content is that how many dreamers are not just using testimonials, but using humor and irony and performance in their online actions. And so a lot of you might be familiar with Dreamers Adrift. Um, they post a lot of undocumented and awkward uh, videos and things like that. They're hilarious and they're really great. This is one by Jesus um, Iniegas, who's a founding member. This is one of his raps. Um, to all my dream heads. And I, it's a rap he made in his car, and I want to play it really quick. I want to play it and then talk about how this is different from Roa a little bit. So. And hopefully it'll be loud enough. Yeah. To all my dream heads out there, this feels for you. Yeah. Yo, eating cells in the flesh coming through with another fresh dream access for my chance and ladies. At laws, undocumented folks, anger and terror babies. Like that senator from Texas said, too many conspiracy theories get into his head, y'all. Yeah, and he's in a position where he could be voting on some critical decisions affecting our communities, acting without impunity. But he ain't fooling me, cause I grew to be skeptical of politicians, cause they Lately, they be like the fishes and brainless and shameless. The type of shit they be pulling in Congress is heinous. No taxation without representation. They don't even know the type of shit that we be facing on the day to day. Living on a daily basis, having to deal with these elephant nutcases. Making us out to be one of the main rivals. Feeling entitled because they be skimming through the Bible. But that's not what Jesus would do. I gotta make a move. <laughs> Being used and abused and refused. This is the truth here. Fuck Fox News. I got nothing to lose. That's why I'm politicking. You tripping if you're thinking that I'm gonna shut my mouth. I'm documented and proud and unafraid. On a legal crusade to get paid. No pay. I'm trying to get my paperwork straight and get all my documents in order. I'm only getting older and I'm trying to get it on this side of the border. Cause life expectancy on the other side is shorter, y'all. It's exactly right. But shit is crazy. But the when that don't face me. <laughs> it makes me want to organize. You're best to recognize right propaganda lies. So I hope it opens your eyes and we can stick together. This endeavor bonded us forever. Remember, if we can stick together, then we've already won. Dream Act now 2011. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> to Dream Team LA and the OC Dream Team, Fuel from Long Beach, and all other Dream Act organizations around this nation organizing around this legislation. Oh, I hate it when the CD skips. All right. I'm out. <laughs> This fun, yes, yes, yes. So, now, in contrast to Roa's effort to create a narrative of immigration that links, that links the undocumented to earlier waves of good immigrants, Iniegas uses phrases such as anchor and terror babies to mock those who would accuse the undocumented of being takers and terrorists. He uses humor, anger, irony, right? Um, he, the material in here aggressively criticizes politicians, which you probably heard him say, they're vicious, they're brainless, they're shameless. Um, he's particularly harsh towards right-wing media, Right, referring to them as those elephant nutcases. 
um, telling his listeners to fuck Fox News. Um, yet despite its agonistic words, I think it's important to recognize how the rap is also funny and playful and hopeful. Um, telling his fellow dreamers, it, you know, in the rap he says, this endeavor bonded us forever. If we can stick together, then we've already won. Moreover, with its concluding shout out to various Southern California dream organizations, the rap is clearly not aimed at convincing skeptical citizens, but at undocumented youths themselves, those who see themselves as part of the fight for immigrant rights. And finally, it's not unimportant that he's rapping while driving. <laughs> because California in 2011 did not grant the undocumented access to driver's license. The act of driving in the video is a quotidian and unspoken act of defiance that frames the entire mm -hmm. rap as a whole. Right? Never mentioned, but there it is. Um, so I want to conclude by sort of noting the fact that what I'm compelled by here is, um, is I think that what they're doing is moving forward towards a kind of language of democracy and membership that I use some of Bonnie Honig's work in this paper to talk about the idea of a gothic genre, a goth, and that's what maybe it's like, I know it's like a weird jump suddenly, I'm like, let's talk about the gothic. But here's why it's important. Um, in her book, Democracy and the Foreigner, political theorist Bonnie Honig says that when we talk about democratic membership, she asks this interesting question. She says, what genre do we read democracy in? You know, and she says, what, what genre do we read democratic membership? And she says, we tend to read democratic membership in the genre of the romance. Right, so membership is loyalty, patriotism is a kind of love, you know, and she says, you know, we mainly tend to think about, as she puts it, obstacles are met and overcome, eventually the right match is made, and they live happily ever after. And that's kind of the citizen's relationship to the state, right? It's, you know, we sort of fight these fights, but eventually, we, and citizenship, we get married, and it all works out, and we live happily ever after. She says, perhaps we ought to think about a more Gothic lens as a way of thinking about <coughs> membership instead. She says, perhaps we should think about not just romance, but gothic romance. And she looks at, and so all of a sudden she's talking about uh, Bronte and Jane Eyre and um, Daphne du Maurier and the story of, and Rebecca and some of these sort of um, gothic romances. As she puts it in the gothic romance, what's interesting is she says, the gothic allows us, as she puts it, to cultivate forms of civic passion and involvement that also allow us, as she puts it, to nurture some ambivalence regarding our leaders and the nation state. And this is what she says about Gothics as a way of thinking about democracy. She says, often in Gothics it turns out that, quote, the nice guy and the scary one are one and often the same person. <laughs> the president who introduces vast new social welfare programs is the same one who escalates the war in Vietnam. And that's a passage from her book. And so if you've read Bronte, it's Rochester, is he good or is he bad? You know, Mr. De Winter, does he kill his wife? Is he a good guy? Um, so one of her points that really resonated for me when writing this is, what does it mean to think about Obama as a Gothic subject, right? That we have a Gothic relationship to Obama, right? A record that, you know, that his record, right, which as we all know here, includes 1.1 million deportations, more than any president since the 1950s. He's deported more people in four years than Bush did in eight. So dreamers, in many ways, I want to argue, have been obey, uh, sort of engaging Obama in this Gothic spirit. Um, as Honig puts it, this is the last quote, and I'll have one more video and I'm done. Um, she says, quote, Gothic readers know that we may passionately support certain heroes or principles or institutions in political life, while also knowing that what we ought not take our eyes off of them for fear of what they might do to us if we did. They know that one can be passionately attached to something a nation, a people, a person, a principle, and be deeply and justifiably, and even therefore afraid at the same time. Democratic subjects related ambivalently, gothically, and yes, passionately to their leaders, their nation, their state, and all their sites of belonging." Unquote. So I want to suggest that in addition to queering immigration, dreamers are articulating this sort of gothic spirit when they, when they sort of pressure Obama to sign the executive order for deferred deportation, right, for DACA. Um, this past June, and I think a lot of people don't remember this, is that this past June, when the National Immigration Alliance occupied President Obama's office in Denver, um, staging a six-day hunger strike while camped out in the Obama for America offices, right? Following the Denver action, Dream activists pledged to carry out acts of civil disobedience across the country. Now that was in June. Now what was really interesting about that, right, this is right when Obama's trying to appeal to Latinos and Asian Americans and dreamers, and it's important, and one thing I talk about in the paper is that dreamers were doing what no immigration organization wanted to do. They were mm -hmm. scared of getting Romney elected. They said, hang back, after the election, we'll pressure Obama. And dreamers said, no, 
we're going to make his summer a summer of undocumented action in all his offices unless he does something, right? So that shift, right, was really critical. Um, and it led to him passing um, administrative relief um, because they were told basically that if he didn't do it, protests would continue until November. And so I think <coughs> the importance of the undocumented and pushing for executive action has been something that's gotten forgotten in the debate. So it's the very last video, it's really shows like a minute. Um, and this is one where um, students were saying, demanding deferred action last year. So. Obama, the immigrant community is under attack. You have shown noble leadership in taking a strong, bold stand. In the protection of our civil liberties and rights as immigrants in this country. What happened to your promise of immigration reform? Were you just pandering to the Latino vote, or was that real talk? You claim you want the Dream Act to pass through a democratic process? But that has been an excuse for you to stand on the sidelines while a million undocumented folks get criminalized and deported under your administration. Presidents in the past have signed executive orders that have positively affected society as a whole. So why can't you do the same for dreamers? As dreamers, we have a duty to confront you and your administration regarding your lack of leadership. Our demand is clear. You have the power to grant administrative relief to all Dream Act eligible youth through an executive order. Do it. Si se puede. I believe you can, Mr. President. You can absolutely take care of that. Pick up that pen and do what needs to be done. That's all I gotta say. Those two schools in the lab. Are they trying to study? Damn! He's just doing this like little cop thing. And that's a bunch of uh, um, Salgado's artwork, which a lot of you might know are familiar with. Um, so I want to suggest that there's something, that importantly, you know, the kind of gothic language that, that Hanig is using is present there, in the sense that, as she puts it, gothic subjects do not expect power to be granted to them by nice authorities with their best interests at heart. Instead, such subjects know, as she puts it, if they want power, they must take it. Subjects who know that such takings are always illegitimate from the perspective of the order in place at the time. Subjects who experience the law as a horizon of promise but also an alien and impositional thing. So for me, I think this language of the Gothic is helpful, and I think one of the challenges we have today is in creating a citizenry capable of thinking about immigration in these more <coughs> challenging and complex ways that dreamers are giving us a chance to think about. So I'll stop there. Thanks so much. on the news to like us getting calls to like the emails like all that kind of stuff yeah so it made me reflect on like when I first got to Berkeley back in uh, 2007 mm -hmm. my first UC Berkeley conversation was about immigration right? mm -hmm. and at that time it was like who are these people to tell us that something is broken in America when they're not even part of America right, right? Mm -hmm. like, like you don't have the agency to tell the immigration system's broken because you didn't even listen to it you know like, and those kind of messaging mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. today it's more like national conversation like the immigration system is broken we need to do something about it right so when we're talking mm -hmm. about these gothic symbols yeah and being actively engaged with that conversation yeah my principal worry now that nationally there's like comprehensive immigration conversation is what's going to happen to the follow-through yeah. right because it's going to be 11 million folks and like people are going to mm -hmm. be coming in and wanting these like services and access to immigration and, and uh identification, access to higher education, but right. what's gonna be the support service when UC Berkeley is has the undocumented student program and we're having conversations with outside states to establish this, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, that's not an institutional priority. Yeah. So what is that relationship? Like, are we saying, yes, come, you know, mm -hmm. and we're gonna give you pathway to citizenship, but the follow-through is way more important. 
the follow through in the sense of yeah. programs and policies. Program supports and you know, all, so on and so forth. Right. It's yeah. kind of like with the civil rights, you know, like students of color being access to the higher education. Yeah. And then you live it vulnerable enough that, you know, Proposition 29 passes, but we haven't seen the same numbers ever since. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. so what's going to happen? Is that going to be the same? Issue that we're going to have now with undocumented people. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Is it Ruben? Is it Ruben? Yeah. Ruben. Yeah. Thank you for that. I mean, it's really. I think this is a really complicated moment we're in. I think it's it's really exciting, but it's also really um, uh, nerve wracking. And one thing I'm curious about is I feel like now that it's on the table again, we've seen um, the voices of dreamers kind of be pushed back a little bit. Like yeah. they're not. And, or the only voices are out there that are on like kind of like on MSNBC or different places are the ones who do the more roa s kind of story, <laughs> yeah, right? Like yeah. don't. And and I think you know one of the the questions is <laughs> people are putting forward a much more sophisticated story that is going to involve institutionalizing these commitments. Okay. And I do think that there's going to be you know when, I, when you look online and you look at these videos and you look at the number of people who watch them, it's not that high. And I always think, and so I think it's, it's right now it's been a proliferation of new social media for fellow activists to look at and to take inspiration from. Mm. But the question for me is like, what happens when this, like what if Fox News gets a hold of, of, of you, know, you know, that rap, right? What will they do? So I think this is one of these really interesting um, questions about the risks of publicity. Mm -hmm. Is that story is going to get twisted, right? And it's going to, and then we're going to have to sort of find ways to keep articulating radical claims while knowing that we live in a culture that wants political sound bites, Really simple stories, you know, mm -hmm. and how do we how do we do something that builds long term structures that you're talking about, like mm -hmm. real institutional commitments, yeah. rather than just slapdash, you know. Um, sometimes the way they set up other programs for diversity, where they they do it mostly as cover, rather than building something serious yeah. and ongoing. Yeah. I think it's a real challenge. I mean, I think it tells us that the organizing we have to do is so not even close to being over. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it is going to be kind of a risk of how do we have this conversation. I'm curious what people think. Like, how do we have this conversation in a larger audience of allies and adversaries mm -hmm. who are watching this, these gothic queer critiques? Um, they're going to get really hit hard. Yeah, um, I, that's, I mean, that's a great question. Yeah. You know, I'm not surprised it's coming from the <laughs> 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 um, He's going to quote it yes. <laughs> so, um, I, oh, Thank yeah. you. That was a great presentation. Mm -hmm. I, I, I guess the, one, the question that I had was with the international perspective of dreamers. Mm. Because, like for example, I was thinking about Mexico, where um, for the longest time, 1940s to 1960, there was romanticization of it. And you know, I remember back in the 1970s, one of the movies that I got taken to Teatro Valle in San Andrew, we got to see Mojado Power. It's actually a movie from Mexico, right? Um, that, but we haven't seen a dreamer power kind of thing, right? You know, and especially yeah. Andaki people. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, so for me, I, I, I guess what I'm wondering is, you know, just, you know, that kind of international uses of, of mm -hmm. immigrant as mm -hmm. political pawn, you know, yeah. how, how has that played out? What are, that you're looking at that in your what are our thoughts? Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I think a couple of things that what you said made me think about, and I'm curious where you think mm -hmm. this is going also because, um, you know, I, you know, I don't have a lot of the answers for this either, right? I'm like, this is, this is a trip, this is the moment we're in, right? But I think that, you know, there's two things that are interesting. One is, I think, a lot of times, you know, dreamers were never able to go back to their home country of origin, um, and the kind of stories they tell about going back and what that might mean really vary, and they vary in politically interesting ways that are both good and bad, right? So, I mean, if you listen to um, Jesus's point where he says, you know, the life life expectancy there, and that's both kind of participating in stereotypes, there's also realities there, right? So, you know, what is his relationship to Mexico, right? To Mexico, I mean, what is his relationship to that country? So what is the relationship of, of the undocumented, of, of, of dreamers to their home countries? And what sorts of narratives resonate to us that, that sort of, um, that sort of um, talk about, um, do they talk about, sometimes this is being framed as like their country, don't let them go back. Like going back would be the most horrible thing in the world. And so it, it, partic it participates in a kind of American exceptionalism mm -hmm. that's really problematic that, 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 that they find themselves kind of caught up in. I think that's one thing. <laughs> the other thing is, I showed, because it's the Center for Latino Policy, I showed Latino Dreamers, but it's not just a Latino issue, right? This is Asian American. I mean, the organizations, you know, Philippines, it's every, you know, it's, a, it's an international issue. And so I think one of the issues of this, how do we as Latinos deal with strong Latino presence without doing something that renders other groups feeling invisible in this mm. movement? I think that's something we have to really struggle with is our own question of numbers and how do we create a movement that, that isn't I overly identified in that way while acknowledging the, you know, so if you have dreamer power, that would be a multiracial vision, mm -hmm. 
right? And so that, so how does, you know, because now it's all being conflated as like immigration equals Latino equals Mexican, mm -hmm. right? So how do we, how do we, uh, and how are dreamers going to sort of, and you know, when you see all those folks, they're not all, they're not all Latino, right? And so this question, but thank you, I mean, I think it's really. I guess it's a follow-up question to what you were just saying. I understand the issue with being overly identified and, and you know the numbers playing mm -hmm. playing it right so that you don't you know you don't exclude anybody. Yeah. But the reality is that you know of all yeah. the millions and millions of people here, in some ways it is a Latino issue bigger mm -hmm. than it is uh, you know I don't know I don't want to I don't right, want to right, piss off but anybody. But um, <laughs> but you know what I mean. So yeah, it, it is a Latino in issue. A, it is in a yeah. way we're playing into like this multicultural. Everybody needs to be excluded. It needs to be nice and cookie cutter when in reality you know when you look at things like um, like health uh, health disparity where people live it is concentrated among Latinos it is concentrated mm -hmm. among there's yeah. a there's a diversity of Latinos there's Salvadoreños there's other folks right right but what 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 do you do with that what do you do with that schism of, of wanting to play nice but at the same time being real and saying you know what no it does affect Latinos in much bigger numbers yeah yeah no I'm curious I mean I, I'm curious what people think about this I mean I think it's a really complicated question I think we need to be honest about the fact that this is large percentages and disproportionately, you know, that there's a huge percentage of Latino presence here. Mexicano presence, but also Latino, Latin America in general. But I think, I think we would be missing, I think the movement itself would be failing to acknowledge that there are alliances and critiques that are deeper than what's going on in one place. So I think, I think we shouldn't view it as kind of like we're just trying to play nice and pretend that we're all equal. That would be kind of a bad strategy, like just kind of a liberal kind of, I don't want to acknowledge that there's like a lot more of this here than that here. Like I don't think it should be done in a kind of PC anxious way, but it should be done in like a self-aware, self-reflective, um, you know, way of thinking about the connections and the international possibilities because what we're talking about are critiques of globalization mm -hmm. and critiques of migration and those exceed, it's also important for us to recognize that the politics of migration internationally are not pretty in a lot of places and it's important for, you know, I always feel like a lot of my students who study immigration, if they just study it on the U.S.-Mexico border side, you know, look at what's going on with Moroccans in Spain, look at, we need a global perspective on how migration operates and how illegality operates and how anti-Arab, you know, politics. So I think we have to think about it in more of a way of the connections, the political connections we have, rather than being like nice to each other. Because that's not that helpful. <laughs> yeah, just a quick question. Uh, the first part you talked, uh, you used the notion of queering quite a bit. Then yeah. the last one you used the Gothic. Yeah. Uh, what is the relationship of, between those two? Are they yeah. Yeah. complementary? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I, I mean, in some ways it was, I think they relate to each other in certain ways. And there's nothing about the Gothic that necessarily presumes a critique of the normal. Necessarily, like I think what, what I found interesting about the querying, two things. I mean, I wanted to talk about the querying of the movement because of the fact that people are coming out, coming out as undocumented. And I mean, we had an event of NYU Dreamers a couple weeks ago in my department, and one person was saying, you know, there's nothing to be ashamed of. You know, but the language was even around it, of, of sexual. You know, it, it, it mirrored the language of sexual orientation, shame. You know, being honest with your family, being honest with your community, you know, not your family, but being honest with the people you know. So, so I think the queer, the question of, and the fact that I think it was critical that queer activists saw the connection and articulated that and, and led the movement itself to, to shift its thinking and that it, we appro it appropriated strategies. So, so, the, so I think the queer politics are really fundamental and foundational to this new moment of queer activism. Um, but I think you're right. I mean, I, 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 the Gothic for me was interesting because that was a story of passionate attachment that is also ambivalent. And that seemed importantly different than <coughs> um, Although I haven't explored sufficiently the ways that those overlap. But I think that there's something about loving something you don't trust <laughs> um, that might be a better language of patriotism than the, than the sort of narrow romantic language of patriotism we have now that's like, you know, if I love America, love America, love it or leave it, it's the best place in the world, shut up, you know, kind of, that kind of patriotism that's unwilling to say, I have ambivalent feelings about the nation state I'm attached to, and I'm passionately attached to it too, you know? And so for me, the Gothic gives you that affective component, but I think you're right, I haven't yet pulled apart precisely what makes something Gothic and what makes something queer, and are there connections are there queer elements to the Gothic? I haven't figured that out, and vice versa. And I need to think about that. So thank you, because it's not cooked. Just to add on that question, I mean, I guess um, I'm curious to know if like Ansel Lewis is also Gothic, yeah. or yeah. Like, yeah. W.E.B. Du Bois is also Gothic. Yeah. I think that there's 
I think there's something new here that you know mm -hmm. that's happening. Yeah. And in a way, you know, what dreamers are doing is kind of the souls of undocumented folk, right? You know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. That's great. No, and I think that. Um, um, you know, Hanig ends by quoting Baldwin yeah. as one of her examples. So I think that the Gothic, yeah, there's a lot of ways that uh, racial identity and, and Gothicness have really interesting parallels. I think you're yeah. talking a lot about affect and a lot about. Um, I just I keep hearing you talking you know, about affect yeah. and this kind of desire. Do you actually engage with any kind of literature on desire? And especially I'm thinking within the frame of Ansaldua, Audre Lorde, mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. like this women of color feminist discussion of yeah. what what is this kind of yeah. desire? I do, actually. I mean, I do a lot of, I have a piece on Richard Rodriguez in Absalan that uses a lot of ethic theory. Um, so it's a crazy, kind of a crazy piece. But, um, but in this piece, I, I mean, I didn't get, I mean, this is like a 45, it's a giant crazy paper. It's way too big. Um, I gave it to the people writing the volume and they were like, stop what you're doing and take this. Um, but one person I look at in here is Jasmine Poir, who writes on homo nationalism. And so, so yeah, I think that, um, the turn to, in a lot of political theory and, and critical legal and, and cultural theory and mm -hmm. these spaces, the turn to affect has been really interesting because it is this turn to thinking about, um, especially people like Heather Love and people in literature who've been looking at, in queer theory especially, who've been looking at what they talk about as bad feelings, mm -hmm. um, or Jack Halberstrom's book, The Queer Art of Failure. Um, it's work I'm engaged in, it informed this work, a lot of it's not directly um, listed in here in this particular paper, but, but I think that affect theory is really helpful because it talks a lot about ambivalent sets of emotive attachments. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, and, and the fact that we, we don't easily get over things like shame mm -hmm. and anger and love, and the fact that we have these such ambivalent feelings towards things that matter to us and it's not, they can't just be simply repurposed into pride and love and loyalty in these quick ways. And I think queer theorists have understood in, in really interesting rich ways how our emotive political attachments are really complicated and contradictory internally. Mm -hmm. And um, and so that's one reason I'm using them to think, I'm using a lot of affect theory to think about Latino conservatives. Mm -hmm. And that's why I wrote about Richard Rodriguez using queer affect theory because Rodriguez is a trip. And as we all know. And um, and, and I think uh, affect theory helps us make sense of someone like him. Mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Well, I have more of like a statement and a question, um, but I really like your presentation and I like um, particularly that you are bringing those different frameworks that I think these youth are using. Mm -hmm. and, and I think one, one thing I wanted to say was um, it would also be interested, interesting to also look at what immigrants that are not undocumented are doing in the coalition. Because, you know, mm -hmm. I'm in that position. I'm not undocumented, okay. yeah. but I am an immigrant and I'm not a citizen, you know? And, yeah. and so mm -hmm. I think that that uh, it, it is also complicated because I, in my position, you know, I've seen people like myself that are supporting the movement in, in the way that they can. And then there's people like, I mean, we yeah. all know that, that are, you know, hating, yeah. you know, and that are, uh, that are yeah. also hurting the movement. So I think it, it would also be interesting. To Population that came out, right? It's Iranians, it's all these, it's all these communities. So I think you're right, and I think we don't explore the tensions generally. <coughs> and how do you participate in a movement, I think this is always an interesting question for like, you know, if you're straight and you care, like I'm a straight scholar who finds the queer theory really rich and valuable, how far can I participate in this literature? If you're white and you're doing race scholarship, if you're, if you're not undocumented but you care about immigrant activism, can I, can, I, can I criticize the movement? How far can I partake in the movement? Can I argue with somebody who's undocumented? Am I, is that okay? Like, what is, the, what is the spirit of agonism that works there? I think we need a lot of literature on that, which is why you should all go to grad school and get PhDs in this and write about this. Because we need you to do this. Because it, we need more scholarship on this. Because it's really, there's a lot going on. There's a lot going on. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks for a fantastic talk. I'm, I'm interested in the tension between the kind of visibility as resistance and the yeah. visibility as assimilation that mm. kind of came out yeah. in the two yeah. um, And I'm particularly interested because I think that it's interesting that you invoke <coughs> at yeah. a moment where I think the mainstream, white-dominated, middle-class, mm -hmm. LGBT movement is decidedly not queer. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know, right, exactly. Yeah, 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 exactly. Kind of Critique of criminalization and critique of the state, and it's right. now pro criminalization through hate crime, pro prison, right, right, um, you know, pro military, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so what does it mean to kind of yeah. Yeah. not 
you know, if, and that happened in a very short span of time. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. That the assimilation of some privileged queers has meant the abandonment of, of all queers. kinds of questions. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so where that moment is in terms of mm -hmm. politically, how we move away from that kind of assimilatory visibility right. and hold on to that queer resistance yeah, and yeah. still achieve kind of demands that people want, the, that yeah. tension. I mean, yeah. I it's not a that's a great tension. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I've, I'm curious about me. I think the question you wrote, visibility is resistance versus visibility is assimilation. And I think that the thing that interested me was that in many ways, when in 2011 and 2010, when, when Dreamers were coming out um, in Chicago and other places, and I happened to be lucky enough, I was at a rally when that happened, well, the first one, the first events where that happened, I was like, oh my god, this is amazing. Um, and it felt like 1988. It reminded me. It was, it was like an act up moment, right? It was, it was a particular kind of moment. Um, and it wasn't about, like, you know, the move and the LGBT movement about, you know, we're going to be good, good parents, priests, and, and soldiers, right? It's, it's a different kind of moment. And, and so I think that, um, I think this is a really, I think what we're going to see, one of the things I didn't talk about here, but that I do in the paper, is I look at, and I use Poir to talk about Nick DeGeneva's work, mm -hmm. where Nick writes a really wonderful essay on queering the politics of immigration. But for him, queering the marches in 2006, which he talks about as being queer, he makes it, everything is about resistance. Everything is, 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 is non-normative and transformational and, and radical. And I think what's really interesting is how radical movements can also become part of very liberal norms, right? You could even argue that for some people, seeing queer dreamers makes dreamers seem less alien, right? Mm -hmm. So the interesting question of because, you know, our own liberal pro-LGBT selves makes us think of ourselves as more civilized than those other places where they're homophobic, <laughs> not us, we're good. You know, so, so there's all kinds of really complex dynamics going on here, and I think one question is, is if this movement, I'm really interested in seeing how do dreamers can dreamers maintain the radical critiques? Or, and, or where will those radical critiques occur? Will they occur online in certain kinds of sites? But when they go on you know, CNN, will they sort of, they'll do the ROA thing? Mm. You know, like how are they gonna balance? And they have to be tactical, right? They're trying to figure out how to get legislation passed. They're trying to do something very concrete, very material, but what might get lost in that moment? And so I think just as the LGBT movement has these diversities internal to it that are not all queer, um, I think we're going to see that with dreamers as well, right? I think we're going to see, that's why I think it's important that we don't talk about dreamers in this monolithic way, like dreamers are doing this. Because they're doing a lot of things. And, they're, and they are going to have a reckoning moment where the strategy debates, right, they're going to have to, as this, as this kicks up, it's going to be very interesting to see what voices win, what can happen. I mean, if you even notice the DNC, I concluded the paper, because the DNC, the day that Julia, uh, Julio Castro spoke, um, uh, was the first Latino to speak at the DNC, and um, I forget her name, but the first Dreamer spoke there, right, also, at the, was the same day that Salgado and others did the Ocubus and got arrested in front of the DNC. And it was this perfect moment of like one dreamer kind of entering in and talking about all that Obama has done for us by passing deferred <laughs> action, and then outside people were like, you know, no papers, no fear, right? And so. So that tells you that the, this proliferation is, is happening. Um, but how that, how that fight ends or resolves itself, I think, is a really open question. But thank you. That's an amazing. Do you have any thoughts about that? I mean, do you feel like? Well, I, I'm working on a project that's kind of looking at that, what, yeah. what happened with the kind of mainstream, mainstream LGBT LGBT yeah. movement and why it is, how people have come to trade in certain claims. And who gets um, lost. Yeah, and who yeah. gets lost and why. Um, yeah. and I think there's lots of different reasons for it. Um, I think it's partly a story about neoliberalism and hmm. how people get moved into certain economies of privilege. Yeah. Um, I think it's partly about co-optation. Yeah. But I also think, I think there's something else there mm -hmm. too, in terms of people's about recognition politics and the yeah. of recognition politics. <laughs> right. And I wonder about the proliferation of activisms. Like, I wonder how um, should we sort of be excited by the fact that activism is going to move in multiple directions, or should we be alarmed by you know, how do we how do we deal with the fact that these movements are going to be so so um, internally contradictory. Mm -hmm. yeah. no, no, I, I oh, I'm sorry. I, 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 okay. Should I get? Yeah. yeah. This is sorry. Yeah. And let me get a couple of people in a row, and then I'll, I'll get a couple of people so I won't be talking. <coughs>
Thank you. So I want to hear more about your conception of digital social capital in relation to a new media. Mm -hmm. I thought it was one of the more provo provocative uh, points of your presentation. It seems like you're granting a lot of agency to the technology mm -hmm. and that it's creating a plurality of voices. Right. And it's liberating the press subject to reach across to other spaces of oppression. Yeah. So I just want to hear how you, you would put that into a conversation with someone that might say, well, you know, the way we create communities outside of new media is, uh, is, a, is, is no different than the way we do it on new media. These stories that are there are perhaps just reaching out to people that already care about this issue. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm, what is mm -hmm. the potential for it to reach across to other states? Yeah, that's a good Let me get more personal. Yeah. I think my question is what accounts for the activists and sort of how, as individuals, you demonstrate how they come to a place where fear and shame are no longer crippling, but in some sense of power. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, thanks. <laughs> I mean, I think that, I mean, the quick answer for that, I just think, is that the, the um, I mean, 2001. <laughs> you know, and I think that it also speaks to, dream activism to me even speaks to the xenophilic, you know, by xenophilic, right, the sort of pro, like the kind of the good immigrant, the good, that good language, but that didn't even work. <clears throat> like, the dreamers were supposed to be the easy case, right? These are the most innocent subjects, they did nothing wrong, and we've only seen anti-immigrant rhetoric go up. So, we can't perform goodness enough. To, to not be under assault. Like there's no narrative of how much they love the country, what they want to do, they want to be in the military. There's nothing you can say that will not cause, I mean, it, the attacks were going to come, you know, so, so that didn't work. Like, so I think that partly it's the fact that performing that kind of good, loyal subject didn't, didn't do that kind of work that they, in fact, all the attacks proliferated and increased. Mm -hmm. So I think, and then I think the frustration of watching it get voted down again and again and again and this generation coming of age. And you know, one thing I, I wrote when I wrote about 2006 is I said, we don't know, all those kids that went to that rally, who are they gonna become? Mm -hmm. them, yeah, yeah. I mean, when you take a seven-year-old to a rally like that, I mean, I think one aspect of the public, when you enter public space, is that who you are coming in is not who you are who leaves, mm -hmm. right? That your subjectivity can be transformed by a political moment. Mm -hmm. And so that happened to a lot of people, and so I think that, is partly why this is that next generation, which is kind of exciting. But I think your questions are really good, right, about technology. And I think I think I am participating in a kind of like technology is going to do all these new and exciting things. And that's the YPP line. And in some sense, I'm I'm interested in the fact that this has created new possibilities. Like if you can Skype as an activist, or you can post stuff on Facebook, or you can um, um, send out and make your own content and post your own stories, those things, that is new. There's, you know, that, is, that is a new way of, 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 of engaging politically, of telling your stories and putting them out. I think that is new. But we still need to be really attentive to the fact that television still operates in certain really critical ways. There's the power dynamics of different kinds of sites, you know, are different. I mean, I think there's, there's it would be a, a wrong story to just say new social media making everything better, right? Because we could also talk about how new social media is making a lot of things worse. Or we could talk about the limits of new social media who has access to different kinds of technology and the difference between producing content versus forwarding content. So I think there's some really complicated questions there that I think this right now is interested in what's exciting about new social media, but there's probably a much more complicated gothic story <laughs> of new social media that we should be. And I think, I mean, I'm, I'm talking, even just the fact that this stuff is ongoing and it's out there is incredibly risky. Um, but did you have other thoughts about that? I mean, do you have suspicions about new social media? Um, yes. <laughs> but not, not in, in relation to this population, I'm, anything I'm in particular? I'm suspicious of the rhetoric of liberating social media. Yes, that it's going to. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I, I get that you're getting at the sort of like yeah. tension and contradictions of it. And yeah. I'm excited about the possibilities, but not granting it. Complete, yeah, you know, no, I think we have to be really wary. Yeah, and I think it's, it's dangerous every time some new technology comes about, and this will happen with television, happen with radio, happen with the phone, the telephone, everybody says democracy is going to be transformed. I mean, every time, if you look back on the literature, every form of new technology, every form of media was new social media at some point. So, you know, we have to be aware of the fact that we, we haven't, you know, we have to be attentive to the history of the media. Oh yeah, I had a question. Oh. Uh, this idea of being uh, a document on a front apologetic could also create um, self-healing as a person mm -hmm. uh, in many ways, not just in media, but as a person, as self-worth. Yeah. When someone comes out, like I do sometimes in classes or in courses, um, yeah. 
I, many of the students are so disconnected with the issue that when you come out, you put a face to the issue. You yeah. humanize yeah. the problem mm -hmm. and create solutions by humanizing it and also yeah. by <laughs> also acknowledging that you're a person. So when you do come out, not necessarily, you necessarily uh, share vulnerability, but also create a face to the issue. You put a face to the issue and yeah. you start to heal that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. But even after DACA, like my question was the rhetoric behind DACA. Like once DACA or immigration in general mm -hmm. policies do pass, how will the rhetoric change in terms of undocumented coming out? And even for the queer community, the issue will still remain once legalization process does come in at all, because they will still feel incomplete as a human being. They mm -hmm. will still be legal, but they will still be incomplete. Right. And this this issue of equality still in general, like still. It's so insurmountable. It's insurmountable. It's yeah. frustration. When you say they'll be incomplete, level. what do you mean? That By, I mean, like, legalization will be processed through the DREAM Act. They will be legal as a resident, but they will still be queer. They will still face issues. They will right. still be incomplete as a human being. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So my question is, like, how does the rhetoric change with DACA, with DREAM Act, with all yeah. these policies, yeah. that, these ideas that, that they create, they're starting to create? Like, yeah. They're playing yeah. with the lives of so many people, so yeah, it's, yeah, it's pretty yeah. funny to see it. Like. Well, thank you, because I mean, you're, I mean, you're talking about what I think is so radical here is, is about people's subjectivity. It's about their, mm -hmm. and it's also about becoming a political subject, yeah. like coming into politics. And I think that question is really, I asked some people like, when the Dream Act passed, mm -hmm. are you like done politically? Like, I think there might be some activists who sort of are like, when these pieces of legislation happen. I'm, I'm done, right? I'm out. I've been doing this for five, seven years. I don't want to be active. And some people, like, they're political subjects now. They understand themselves as having larger fights. They feel connected. But I think maybe some people's even identities as being dreamers are going to be transformed by the fact that once the legislation's passed, I'm not a dreamer. <coughs> How will I feel if I'm a citizen? What kind of citizen am I? What does citizenship even mean? So the, the questions about becoming a complete subject, feeling or feeling, um, what, what's the story? What's the next page? of your sense of yourself as a political person. That has not been written. Um, and, um, but I think you're right about the questions of shame and pride and putting a face. You know. yeah. Thank you for being here. <laughs> well, thank you so much. This has been Woo! really great.